won the right to rest peacefully in Texas water. Howdy and hello, I'm Travis Davis, Vice President of Ship Operations, Battleship Texas Foundation. Today we're talking about the Armor Conning Tower, this big chonky boy right here. Um, so Armory Conning Tower is, uh, in case you don't know, is an armored position that the ship could be conned from or steered, navigated, and in, in, in non-Navy non -Navy speak there. Um, <clears throat> the viewports behind me is the only way you can really look out. There were some observation periscopes on the thing. Um, and this, this conning tower is very unique in the sense that it's, it's the only one of its kind. Um, if you go to look at the other battleships like you know, the Alabama, they have a really great conning tower. It's been great, re greatly restored. And uh, the, well, the New Jersey and the Iowa and the Massachusetts and well, North Carolina and all the other great battleships that are out there. Um, theirs are much different. So the fast battleships had a two level conning tower. So there was the conning level, kind of like where I'm standing at right now. And then above it was the second level. So it was two story. And the upper level was the fire control tower. So where the, it was a fire control position, right? Just like it mirrored the four top way up there. Ours didn't have that. So Texas's didn't have that. It had a fire control room that was embedded inside the conning tower itself. And uh, when we do our walk around in here in a little bit, uh, we'll go inside and we'll actually have a look-see and all that stuff. The conning tower has also uh, played a major role in, in the ship's history, most notably the Battle of Sherberg on, on June 25th, 1944. And in a little bit, stick around, we're going to go on top of the conning tower and we're going to talk a little bit about that battle and the, the, what, what happened around this structure and as part of this structure. Well, we're on top of the conning tower now, and this is the site of uh, Texas's really um, only battle damage. I mean, she did get some other, but this was the most severe battle damage. And this occurred on uh, June 25th, 1944, during the Battle of Shoreburg. Uh, a German 244 millimeter battery uh, fired from roughly that direction at a low, the shell came in a low angle and impacted right here, this divot right here on the conning tower, low glancing blow, hit the um, direct the number three director right here. Um, there was like, there was a fire control director inside the, the armored conning tower. It sheared the periscope off for it and impacted on the base of the navigation bridge on this uh, support column right here. And uh, caused it to explode. When it exploded, it peeled up the, the uh, navigation bridge. So when we go below in a little bit to see the inside of the, the uh, conning tower in the fire control booth, uh, you'll see how tiny of a space that is. And there was a director hanging in there, came up through that hole right there. And again, the shell just sheared it right off. It fell and, and injured uh, the, the gunnery officer and then two phone talkers that were in that room. This is a pretty important space for us. There's lots of evidence, little evidence of that, of that battle damage. And you know, like this, this divot here, uh, we'll, we'll show you in just a second uh, all the bent uh, angle brackets that are up here that have been deflected from that shell damage and little pock marks and things like that and we'll give a little walk around of, up here. Alright, so now we're walking around the top of the conning tower. Uh, right here is one of the observation periscopes that was used to navigate from inside the pilot house. So, or the, the sorry, the conning tower. Um, the conning tower had to do the same functions in battles like the navigation bridge, so which is like being able to do uh, navigation, so spotting uh, uh, ships and things like that to be um, keep formation and things like that. And it's hard to do that, you know, through these little slits that we'll see here in a little bit. Uh, and uh, the um, sorry, I'm I'm trying to keep from stepping off the edge here because well it's a good it's a it's a bit of a fall there so there we go we're walking around there's turret two low turret two so it had to do a lot of those functions as, as well and the best way to do that was was you know, these little observation periscopes because it would give you bearings uh, to various things you know for shore target shore targets for for navigation or um, you know, navigation um, fixes and then um, ships as well um, and then you can estimate ranges off of that so there we go there's a little walk around here on the outside of the conning tower top there you are. and then here's back to the navigation framing uh, support 
There we are. Whoop. All right. So, and then um, we have another periscope here, observation periscope. And then we have another for the inside the fire control booth of the uh, conning tower, which is right below us. And then another, that's where the director number three, or the third director, uh, came through at. It was sheared off. And then another where there was another observation scope. And we'll see all that stuff down below in a minute. And then as we come up here, so we get to see the, the you get to see some of the battle damage from Schwarberg. So the, this, this angle bracket being deflected upwards. Um, you know, there's a lot of pack rest damage in here um, in terms of just age. Um, another piece of battle damage here where it's been deflected upwards. Um, that's not pack rust that's caused that. That's the, the explosion of that 240 shell. Now we'll do a video later on on um, on the conning tower, or not on the conning tower, but on the Shoreberg and that engagement. Because that's a pretty neat story to tell. Um, it's a, definitely a story of a lot of heroism, and um, we, we we want to share that and uh, uh, honor the men who, who serve on that day. So here's another piece of damage right here. You can see where the frames actually gouged right here and deflected. Um, and that web of the frame, the web of that support. And let's see if there's any other any other damage that I see. It's not just corrosion damage. Uh, point out that the you know we recently got a half a million dollar grant from the uh, Save America's Treasures program. A lot of that that work that that's funding is going to be repairing a lot of the pack rust damage that's up here uh, and corrosion damage. So like like this, so you can see all the rust is pecked in there. Um, so we're going to try to get all that, we're going to get all that fixed, not try to, we are. Anyways, so yeah, now we're, like I said, this is the conning tower, top of the conning tower. Um, one of the more pleasant spots on the ship. And of course, that's the main, uh, the foremast right there. And then right behind it is uh, CIC. And below that was the, is the navigation office, the motor generator room, signal records room right there. Um, and then the rest of the signal bridge. Before we start the walkthrough, let's talk about the armor of the conning tower. The walls of the conning tower are 12 inches thick of class A armor. That's premium Navy armor. The ceiling or the overhead is eight inches thick of STS or special treatment steel. And the floor of the conning tower is three inches of STS. So this armored trapezoid is, floats above the deck of the ship on foundations, right? Heavy framing. Around the framing is wrapped 50 pound STS, which is inch and a quarter thick light armor. And then within that is the armored tube uh, that runs from the conning tower down to um, Central Station, which has an 11 inch thick wall on it. All right, so we're on the super searcher deck right outside the captain's cabin. We're fixing to go up into the conning tower, up this, this, this ladder here, it's about a 12 foot climb. So come with me and you'll see in a world of Exploration. All right, so we're in the conning tower foundation on the signal bridge level. I just climbed up that ladder right there and sung to you. And, and then up this little ladder right here and on up into the conning tower. So there are three ways into the conning tower. One is this ladder here. The other is this hatch here that leads out onto the signal bridge going through all that web of stuff. Yeah, that's fun, isn't it? And then, um, uh, and then the um, armor tube that leads from um, the conning tower to central station. And we'll look at that in a little bit. Um, this hatch is, is a rare hatch on the ship. It's one of the, well, it's the only one that swings upwards uh, to close. It's the only armor hatch. And to be honest with you, I think it's the only uh, hatch period on the ship uh, that swings upward to close. Uh, almost all the other hatches and scuttles are swinging down to close and up to open. This one's backwards. Um, and I think largely the, that why that is is because there's not a lot of room within the conning tower. Um, and this, this heavy, uh, um, thick um, hatch um, is, is counterweighted right over here. Sorry, with my light here. Uh, it's counterweighted, and you can see the counterweight right there. 
and um, it swings this way to close the hatch and then upwards to uh, upwards for the hatch to open. So, so in theory, a man can pull the hatch closed without much force, uh, though with as much corrosion and uh, paint is on this thing, I, I doubt that it would, we would work without a lot of effort. So to give you an idea of how much force is needed to close this hatch, um, this hatch is three inches thick. The, um, a square foot of half inch steel weighs 20 pounds. So this hatch is roughly uh, two foot by three foot. So, so I'm gonna do the math on that one, drop in the comments, and we'll know how roughly how heavy this hatch is, uh, give or take a little bit. And then how much that counterweight has to weigh, approximately, again, approximately. So without further ado, yeah, this is kind of what the Connie Tower Foundation looks like. There's not a lot of occupied space in here, so. All right, without further ado, we're gonna go on up. And, and speaking on the foundation, um, it is, um, it goes all the way down to um, second deck. And on second deck, when the ship's open, you can come see inside the, the foundation itself because it's usable space. That's where all the medical stores were kept, was, uh, or the bulk of the medical stores was kept on um, second deck in the um, Connie Tower Foundation. All right, so as we come it through, we're going through this three inch STS um, armored deck here and actually into the conning tower. You can see there's a false floor and then the armored deck and the false floor is just nothing but for cabling. All right, we're in the conning tower. And the first thing I want to point out is that this space has been um, partially uh, restored. And it was a uh, restoration that started in the early 2000s and uh, had to stop because, well, it wasn't a high priority. There were higher priority projects that needed to be completed. And it just never was picked back up because the, the ship's needs changed. Um, one of the reasons um, this, prior, this project was put so low on the priority list is because it's hard to get the general public into. And then it might be even difficult to get folks on a hard hat tour up here mostly because of this ladder and the way the difficulty in accessing the space. Um, so that really made it more difficult to justify kind of continuing this, pro this, this project on, especially after it became more um, stable. I think the space became more stable. So the first thing I want to point out in here is um, that the conning tower itself is you know, like I mentioned outside, it is a, a armored place that the ship can be navigated from in, a, in combat. And uh, the Navy wanted, when the ship was built, there wasn't a pilot house. The Navy wanted the ships to con the ship from the, from the conning tower. They wanted to, you know, in, in battle, they wanted the, the captains protected. So they didn't build pilot houses on some of the newer dreadnoughts. Um, <clears throat> the... Um, but there was an open bridge behind the pilot house and it was exposed. What that meant is that when the conning tower was being used, the only times the conning tower were used were uh, when the ship was in combat, like at Shoreburg or at Okinawa or many of the other ships' engagements, or in, in really heavy seas when that open bridge wasn't, wasn't tenable. And I'm talking about before the, the pilot house was built in 1919. Um, <clears throat> and that's because the captains as you can see, there's not a lot to see outside, and there's not a there's some viewports here, but they don't you don't get a lot of, of um, visibility, and captains really wanted the ability to see outside and maneuver. So even at Shoreburg, Captain Baker was on the bridge, running from bridge wing to bridge wing through the pilot house, so that he could spot the fall of the shells. And here he couldn't do that. Um, so it, it, the the amount of Situational awareness is, is greatly reduced inside this armored, uh, well, this armored trapezoid. Um, so that's why most captains didn't use this. Um, going into combat, this would have been manned with the same kind of watch that would have been on the bridge. So you would have had a, a lee helmsman here at the throttles. You would have had a helmsman to man the throttle, uh, to man the, the helm. Um, 
you would have a guy at the radar repeater, usually the ship's bugler or a bugler, um, and sometimes a marine. Um, there was a radio desk, not there, but right over here. And then here was a, 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 a chart table. So for one of the quartermaster's mates to uh, keep uh, fixes either with on coastal um, <clears throat> navigation points or ships in the formation. And then over here we have uh, a quartermaster's desk or officer's de uh, uh, desk uh, where the ship's log would have been kept. Again, if this were a primary conning station. So at the time, most of the time, you know, normal steaming conditions, this place would not be manned. Um, it was only manned in general quarters. And then, and then again, late in her life, um, <clears throat> after the bridge was destroyed at Shoreburg, this was the primary conning point for the ship for that time until it could be re rebuilt um, in Portsmouth, England. And then, like I said, a lot of the communication functions here, so you'd have sound hard phones, um, ceasefire, um, the electric whistle solenoid would, was here so that you could electrically sound the whistle, uh, uh, collision alarm, general quarters alarm, chemical attack alarm, all that stuff would be mounted here. It's the same stuff that you would see on the bridge, just in here, inside this armored box. And, <clears throat> and I keep saying, you know, a lot of things above or in the pilot house were replicated down here. They were, um, and there were almost as many people in here as there was in the, in the pilot house. So you're looking at at least two quartermasters. You would have had either a seaman or another quartermaster's mate right here. This hole, that is where uh, observation periscope was. There's one here and there's one on the port side. So we're on the starboard side of the ship. And um, <clears throat> so he would have been looking for doing the same thing as the uh, lookouts on the bridge wings would have been doing. Um, you know, using the gyro repeaters to take fixes on like on ships or again on coastal navigation targets or just observing. <clears throat> but they would have been using periscopes to do that. Again, because of the limited visibility. And then so you have, you know, what, four quarters master's mates, a radio man, a bugler, a bosun's mate, um, you know, uh, who would be making all the PA, uh, the 1MC or PA announcements. And then you would have the helmsman, Lee Helmsman, um, two phone talkers, and then you get into the officers, which if, again, in Schroberg, uh, or at general quarters rather, like at Schroberg, uh, Commander Cabanius, the ship's XO, was in here. Uh, the XO, this was his battle station, so he would have been here near there would have been a, uh, a kind of a standby conning officer and a standby officer of the deck that would have been here, again, in case the bridge was knocked out like it was at, uh, at Shoreburn. All right, so with all those folks in here, it would have been um, a little roasty. So if you look, we only have two vent registers in this room. There's one there. And there's one right over here, the little white thing pointing up. And uh, so that there's a blower below that would have been forced down here. And that may or may not have been on during general quarters, depending on um, the, the situation. Um, I have to look and actually see if it's a condition X-ray or zebra to make sure. It's probably, probably would have been off by person ventilation on the ship. And then we'll come around over here in a minute and go inside the fire control booth. So... Um, now, one quick thing here, okay, so there's a lot of things missing right now, again, they're kind of in storage, some are sitting on the deck over here, and some are in storage uh, within the ship, um, <clears throat> so we have what the, the um, engine order telegraph here, and then up above would have been the uh, ship's oh, well, pedometer, which was basically the ship's speedometer telling how fast the ship's going. Or, or a, actually, I'm sorry, it would have been a revolutions indicator, not the pathometer. The pathometer was mounted uh, over this way. Um, and then for the helmsman, his indicators uh, was a rudder angle indicator here. And then a, um, this is the helm for the electric steering. Um, so, and then, which was the primary means of steering on the ship. So just, you can see, oops, sorry, it's not bolted down. Um, you know, right rudder right here left rudder right there. So pretty simple. It was easy. Um, 
to, to operate versus the the big helm here um, which is this is just a mechanical linkage that goes straight down to central station where there's a telemotor a telemotor is just basically a low pressure hydraulic pump um, when you turn the wheel it's you're manually pumping that pump or the uh, on the telemotor which is then pushing hydraulic fluid all the way back to the starboard engine room to the steam steering engine where there's uh, and you're controlling a set of actuators that open and close the throttle onto the um, um, steam steering engine. So um, to make the rudder go over full um, using this, uh, an oral history said it took about uh, 100 revolutions of spinning the wheel. To you know, because you're again you're pushing hydraulic fluid close to 200 feet, if not more, um, from 60 feet below us that way. And then for the helmsman, there also been a gyro compass repeater and um, um, yeah, there, yeah. <clears throat> Sorry, got a little vapor lock there. And um, so, speaking of which, uh, the helmsman. Now, one thing is, if you look right here, there's a platform. You can see it has like two handholds in it. Um, in the original build of the ship, when this ship was new, um, this platform had a mechanical linkage in it that would raise and lower. So you could crank it up and elevate the platform or lower it down. And it's in its current lower position now. Now that mechanical mechanism is gone. Um, and it was, we don't know why, I don't know when it was, was removed and uh, maybe someone else does. But, <clears throat> and the whole purpose was that was for the helmsman to be able to see out the viewport. Now I am six foot tall. My, the average height for guys when the ship was built was like five eight. Uh, they were short, um, just how it was. So at six foot, I have the camera right at my eye level. And let's look outside. Let's see what we see. Come on, zoom. Why don't you? There we go. Um, I can barely see the jack staff. I can't see the um there goes a car by and i can't see the bow so if we when i stand on my tiptoes come on auto exposure that's not gonna work uh you can there you go now you can see the the barely make out the point of the ship, the point of the bow, and then the guns of turret too. There's a left gun, and then the light gun's just kind of wide it out. I'm sorry, the glare on the Lexan is pretty bad. So, um, but anyways, so that's what, but the reason why um, the Navy really backed away from having the, I guess, uh, a, a, a helmsman being able to see outside is because they didn't need to. A helmsman wasn't steering the ship like you would a boat, right? Okay, yeah, it is kind of like steering a boat, but he wasn't seeing where he was going and steering that direction, right? It was more along the lines of he's standing here and what he's getting are orders to turn the rudder a certain number of degrees. So turn the rudder, uh, you know, right 10 degrees until he's told to rudder midship or a, given a different rudder angle order, or he's told to steer a specific course. So whether it's, uh, you know, steer 220 or uh, 180 or something like that. So he really didn't need to see. So it's kind of like flying an airplane in, you know, when in, um, in the clouds. You don't need to see outside. You use your instruments and you're getting directions on, on where to, to fly to or where to steer the ship or how to, how to, how to steer the ship. All right, so <clears throat> before we move on from this little corner of the ship, I want to show you all this guy. This is the trunk to Central Station. Now, when the restoration was started on this space, most of these cables, uh, when they were taken loose from the equipment, just kind of fell down the trunk. And they were run pretty loosely. Now, this trunk, this tube rather, is an armor tube. The walls of the tube are 11 inches thick. Yes, 11 inches thick. 
So, and the purpose of that was is so that all of the uh, electrical, all the uh, uh, cabling for the, the instrumentation, um, you know, for the, the fire control or the red or angle indicator would, would be protected. And then also the voice tubes, so those are all voice tubes, right? Or at least those two, that's a voice tube, and that's a voice tube, which is this voice tube right here. This guy right there, that's a voice tube. Um, and that is the uh, shaft for the uh, steam steering stand, you know, this, this guy right here. Um, so it'll all be protected, uh, and a shell could take it off. Now, again, this trunk is um, a ways down there. So you see the light way down there. That is the, um, that's the, um, well, that's Central Station. We'll do a video on that sometime later. But now there you go. But you could climb all the way up and down this trunk. Um, you know, there's a lot of rungs there. And it was a fairly, outside of a long climb and a hot climb, um, it was a pretty easy climb. Um, one that I haven't got to make yet and that I really, really want to in the future. Um, so other little house, other little things up here, you have um, target bearing indicator there. Um, over here, like I said, this is the another quartermaster's desk, this little chart table. It's a homemade chart table. That is the original table. Um, this guy up here is the radio desk. And inside, it has telegraph keys. So you can, operator could clack away sending messages. And then these are um, headphone junk boxes. <clears throat> or jack boxes for headphones, I'm sorry. And then this guy right here, that is one of the original uh, viewport plugs. Um, so that could, see, you can see the shape of the viewport. And then the speaker amplifier for their radio telephone is part of the radio desk. And then a heater. Um, so one thing I will point out is, again, you know, kind of the weird shape of these uh, viewports, and uh, which is they're wider on the inside and narrow in the front. For the center point, the center viewport, it's much wider, and it's wider on the outside and narrow on the inside. And it all pertain, you know, pertain to what you were trying to do. So, in here, if you're looking out, right? So we're gonna look. It's on the north side of the the port side of the ship, it's to the north. So if we're sitting right here, you don't you don't get a lot of, of view. But if you move over, you can see a, a bigger arc of uh, of visibility, right? And then um, with the, the center viewport up here, it was, you could stay in one place and get a much wider viewpoint the other way. So, and that way they're kind of like um, um, uh, um, arrow loops on castles or embrasures, so in, in fortifications. All right, moving on. So this guy right here, that's the armored door going into the fire control booth. This is two inches thick of special treated steel, STS. So it's lightweight armor. And then the bulkhead here going in is, again, two inches thick. So on other battleships, this would be a whole room about the size of uh, the Connie, the full size of the Connie Tower, and it would be one level up as part of the Connie Tower. So an upper floor and a lower floor with an armored floor in between. Um, on this ship, um, the original designs called for a, um, for that design basically, and, but instead of it being the full size of the Connie Tower, it was a round, uh, a round Connie Tower. So it was just a round tube basically with uh, viewports for a rangefinder. Um, and for whatever reason, you know, it made it all the way through Nor Newport News. There was construction drawings issued for it, but it was never installed. There was a decision made to not do that. We don't know. I don't have any records showing why those decisions were made, but and we ended up with this unique Connie Tower, which is the same Connie Tower that was on most of the, uh, if not all of the pre-World War I battleships. So, 
where I'm standing at right now, this would have been the, uh, the gunnery officer. This was his battle station. It was in this armored you know, room. And above me, right here, sorry. So that's the roof of the, um, the, the conning tower. And you see how thick this is. So this is four inches here in one layer, and then another four inches above here. So one layer, there's the, the separation layer. So one layer, one layer. And the director stuck up through here. And then it was what was knocked down at Shoreberg, you know, injuring the, um, the gunnery officer. And there was also two phone talkers in here, one over here and then one over here. And they had their own spotting scopes, respectively, as well. So um, the instrumentation in here was mostly focused around well, the gunnery aspects of this and the fire control aspects of it. So you had the, the, the gun director here, which was not the primary gun director. It was actually a tertiary gun director. Um, so you had main battery spot, uh, you know, um, the main battery director station, the foremast, at the very top of the ship, that was spot one. So that was a primary director. And the fire control tower uh, was spot two, and then here was spot three. Uh, and turrets two and four were spots four and five, because those had smaller directors in them as well. So everything was really geared towards that. So these um, range and deflection indicators are for each of the other battery or other uh, uh, main battery director stations. So spot one, spot two, and and then um, more sound powered stuff, headphone jacks, and then you had a target. I'm oh, sorry, target bearing indicator. Is that better? No, sorry. So you had a target bearing indicator here um, that showed you what the designated target's relative bearing was to the ship. And then over here, we have you know, turret ready indicator lights. So whether each turret is ready to fire or not, those would indicate when the gun houses said, or the turret captain said, we're ready to fire. And then over here, you have the um, um, kind of turret um, bearing indicator. Um, and it is, um, if you look, uh, so you have all five, one for each turret, and you have the stops. So there's the white right there. One second, let me zoom in. So the white is the, the mechanical stop, or where the, the hard stop is, and then here is the kind of a, the cutout, so where you start hitting structure. So like turret, you'd hit, start hitting turret two if you got beyond the red, red arc there. Same thing for here, you would start hitting the superstructure for turret two. For turret three, you'd start hitting the, the galley. And then for turret four, you would hit the main mast. So you can see it here. And then turret uh, five, it's a little wider, you would hit turret five, uh, four if it went rotated all the way around. And so you can see the relative, or the, the, the basic fields of fire for the turrets. Now, what's interesting to me about the indicator for turret three is there is no indicator for the after side of the turret or the forward side of the turret. Um, well, really, the after side of the, the, the barbette because it's not going to hit anything, but that's not really a usable field of fire because turret four is right in front of it and the main mass is right there. So I think that's kind of interesting. I don't know why they invented that. I guess they just like, okay, we know that that's going to be an issue. Let's make sure, you know, we already have an, our established, uh, you know, fire no fire area. It must be, you know, again, it must be broadside or something like that. And then again, more more sound powered um, telephones, and then we have ceasefire alarms for the main battery. And then lastly, we have ship service telephone. So. This is an automatic electric telephone that was made in the mid-1920s, and the ship had them everywhere. There's actually supposed to be one inside the conning tower. The wooden base is there, but it's, the phone was pulled down for uh, restoration. So, okay, now, lighting. <laughs> so, there was no lighting outside of, you know, in the fire control booth, that was the lighting that you got. The instrumentation had its own lighting, but outside of these two desk lamps that are affixed to the bulkhead or to the instruments, there was no lighting. In here, 
The only lighting was the standing lights. So these lights were on all the time, and they were red lights. Um, <clears throat> in fact, here is the lens for one right here. So that was <coughs> that was shine at the deck, and that's the lighting that you got. Um, sorry for the clatter there. Um, so the stream lights are just there for, well, to help us. But other than that, this is what the conning tower would look like outside of the standing lights. What light came through the viewports? Um, and then, should there be a fire or anything in here? We have um, a sprinkler right here, and then around inside the fire control booth as well. That's where it went through. And that's the conning tower, folks. Um, yeah, um, these are the original viewports um, and uh, viewport plugs. Most of them are rotted out, uh, and that's why we've used plexiglass to uh, replace them, at least keep some light in here. Um, but yeah, and they've been, we've tried to, in the past, to have new ones made, and they have not done very well, or not been very well constructed. So. They're just so difficult to make and they don't get good seals. So that's why we use plexiglass. I'd rather really like to do something different than the plexiglass, but hey, you can do what you do. Right now, I'm just happy that it's a dry space and we don't have water leaking in again. So you thought our walkthrough was over. However, we're gonna do something neat. We're gonna go through the foundation and out onto the signal bridge. So we're gonna go through this archway here. We're gonna hang a right and then go through a lightning hole and then out on to, through the hatch, out onto the signal bridge. So, and you'll see how difficult this is. And probably listen to me, fatty grunt. All right. Now, the original, so there's another archway right here. Well, for whatever reason, someone decided to put ventilation ducting and the deck drain for, or one of the deck drains for the conning tower in here. Not pointing any fingers, <coughs> Navy, <coughs> but it just makes it a little difficult to crawl through. So we're going to go through this lightning hole right here. <laughs> yeah, and there we are. Ouch! Now we're on the signal bridge. We just came from that hole right there. So. No, when the ship was hit, Captain Baker did not go from all the way up on the pilot house, down the ladders, to the signal bridge, which we're on, through that hatch, through that way. No. Nope, he went through this hatch here. See, so the hatch was open. So, there you go. He did come all the way down, but went through that hatch which opens up right outside the captain's cabin and the entrance to the conning tower. And thus, our tour endeth. Well, now you've seen the, the got the nickel tour of the conning tower. And uh, well, if you can't see for me, I am uh, a little hot and a little sweaty. There's not a lot of ventilation in this space. Um, back in the day, there would have been air coming through these airports, so the viewports, and then there would have been power ventilation in here. But in combat, there would have been no power ventilation coming in, and the only air would have been coming through the viewports. So very stifling, and with about you know close to a dozen men in here, it would have been a little, little toasty, especially for the guys in the fire control booth uh, at general quarters. And uh, you know, just remember, of all the combat casualties that the ship uh, received, the three. Three of them were in that room right there. Minor injuries, but they were still injured. So keep that in mind, you know, again, and as you, as you walk away from this video. And the other thing I would say, you know, as a, as a takeaway is that yes, we we're in an armored trapezoid right here. It's not as fancy as the modern battleships, you know, the treaty battleships and the Iowas, and certainly not as roomy, but you know, it was designed for a specific purpose, and it did its purpose well. It protected the men in this space from shellfire. The other thing I want you to take away as well is this armored trapezoid is 
up in the air. It's supported by a massive foundations that go all the way down to the third deck. There's light armor that goes around the, those foundations, but almost every single spit, bit of that space within the, that foundation is utilized. And when you come to see the ship when we reopen in 23, and we expect to see you here in 23, go down the second deck, go to medical stores, and you're looking inside the foundations of the conning tower. That is where um, ship's medical supplies are stored, and that's been where they've been stored from the beginning. Remember, this is where this ship was designed for a thousand men. At the end of her service life, she had 1,800 men aboard. So space was a premium. And a lot of space within the conning tower that hadn't normally been utilized was utilized again um, in, in later on in life. So like in the 40s, a pyrotechnic storage was put in on the Sigma Bridge level. And then there was a more storage for uh, other, other things. We didn't show you that, but we can talk about things like that in the future. Um, but the main thing was talking about this space, the, the uniqueness of it. It's one of the most heavily armored places on the ship. 12 inch thick armor here, eight inch thick armor here, three inch thick armor there, or two inch, sorry, and then three inch down here. So, hope you guys enjoyed it. Have a good one, y'all. Bye.